And um, welcome to this next session of the MRI Together Conference, where we'll be hearing a number of talks related to the applications of big open data sets. My name is Meher Jitikonda. I'm an assistant professor in the Martino Center at Massachusetts General Hospital, and I will be moderating this session. The first half will consist uh, first of two talks, followed by a question and answer period, and then we'll move on to the second half of the session, which will follow a similar format. Just a few reminders before we get started, this session is being recorded and uh, being broadcast live, and anyone interested in the transcripts for these sessions, they'll be available on YouTube. And if you haven't already done so, please take a look at the um, MRI Together Code of Conduct, which can be found on the conference website. And uh, finally, questions are of course highly encouraged, but please remember to use the Q&A box and not the chat function to submit these. Uh, the questions can be submitted at any time and not just at the end of the talk, so please take advantage of this so that other attendees can view and um, upload the questions that they would also like to see post to the speakers. With that in mind, I'd like to uh, welcome the first speaker of our session, Florian Knoll from New York University, who will be speaking about fast MRI, accelerated imaging with AI. Please take it away. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the opportunity to speak here. Thanks to everybody for joining all over the world. I'm going to give you a little bit of a 20 minute or so um, overview of the FAST MRI project of the data sharing initiative and about the research challenges that we hosted um, over the, the last couple of years. I uh, just have a declaration here in the beginning. So this project and the entire challenge was part of a research partnership of NYU with Facebook AI research. And we also got a grant from AWS uh, for the data hosting. Okay. Um, yeah, for those of you who don't know it um, or um, have not seen it yet, this is the, the web page of the last MRI project. Um, Orient, yeah. sorry. Yes. Uh, you, you're not sharing yet. Seriously? You're not sharing this. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was, right? Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so, I'll do it. so nothing I said. Uh, you saw this. You saw the slides. <laughs> All right. Okay. What about now? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. All right. So yeah. So this is my title. These are my declarations, and uh, you do see this now, right? Yeah, perfect. All right, awesome. So we're gonna take a look at the um, the fast MRI uh, data set and and the research challenges. So just to get us started, a little bit of background: the topic uh, that we are trying to address with the fast MRI data set and with the challenges is the problem or the task of using machine learning for MR image reconstruction. And what that means is we are using deep neural networks to process the MR images from the acquired case-based data. And to be a little bit more specific, we are talking about accelerated imaging. So- Sorry, uh, may, may I interrupt again? So, so sorry, but uh, we are seeing still the outline uh, pay slide. So it's not- Moving forward, uh, it is not moving forward. It is moving forward for me. Uh, maybe <laughs> try. Maybe tr yeah, we could try to do it once again. Uh, sorry for the. Uh, okay, so maybe yes. And we start sharing. Okay, you see it now, the title? Uh, no, it's, uh, what, what I see is a blank screen, a blank black screen. Uh, okay. Oh. Um, okay, what about if I just share my entire screen? Uh, that green green screen this time. Okay. Mm. 
So you don't see my slides at all, right? No. Uh, so okay. what, 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 what about uh, we troubleshoot this in a separate room and uh, can continue with the next talk and then we can return to this talk after that. All right. Let's try that. Yeah. All right. Talk to you sorry, later. sorry. No worries. <laughs> Yeah, so we'll move on to the next speaker for now. And uh, the next speaker will be Matt Glasser from the Washington University School of Medicine, who will be speaking about the Human Connectome Projects approach. So Matt, please go ahead. We see the slides okay. Yes. Do we see them advancing? <laughs> yes, we do. Excellent, all right. So thanks for the invitation. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the Human Connectome approach project approach to uh, brain imaging and, and also this concept of imaging data phenotypes. So I'm going to cover uh, three main things today. Uh, first, you know, what do I mean by HCP style neuroimaging data? Then how do we you know, process that data to maintain you know, its quality? Uh, and then what do I mean by imaging data phenotypes, sort of the interesting measures that we, we want to get you know, at the end of the process? So HCP style neuroimaging data. So I'm talking about high quality multimodal MRI data, including structural, functional, and often diffusion MRI that's acquired on as many subjects as is feasible. Um, talking about using high spatial, temporal, and angular resolutions, enabling accurate neuroanatomical mapping, selective fMRI denoising, and you know, maximum achievable accuracy of, of structural connectivity. In general, uh, to be successful, uh, achieving these goals requires, you know, at least a three Tesla or a higher field strength scanner, you know, a multi-channel head coil, at least 32 channels or higher, uh, and then optimized pulse sequences such as, you know, multiband EPI or, or motion corrected, you know, VNAV corrected uh, structural images. Um, so, you know, one of the you know key uh, decisions that one has to make when acquiring MRI images is what what spatial resolution uh, are, are you going to use? Um, this is a group average uh, map of of cortical thickness here, and and over here we have the the histogram of cortical thickness. And it turns out that the you know the mean cortical thickness is around uh, 2.6 millimeters, uh, and the minimum cortical thickness is 1.6 millimeters. And those measures, you know, should influence our choice of spatial resolution. So, you know, traditionally in the past, you know, people were acquiring with fMRI with voxels that were bigger than, you know, mean cortical thickness, sort of in what I've termed this low resolution fMRI regime. Um, but, you know, what we want to do is, is, you know, acquire uh, uh, voxels that are, are higher resolution. Um, better than, than the mean cortical thickness. Uh, so, you know, most of the studies in the literature still are, are low resolution fMRI, but at some point I'm not gonna be able to say this anymore. And we're getting closer to the point where, where that's, that's changing now. Um, but our fMRI resolution is ideally less than 2.6 um, millimeters isotropic. Um, you know, for the human connection project, we were at uh, two millimeter isotropic uh, for the fMRI and 2.5 millimeter isotropic uh, for uh, the arterial spin labeling data. And then for our high resolution 3D structural scans, things like T1 weighted and T2 weighted images, we ideally want to be at 0.8 millimeter isotropic um, or less. And that's basically uh, half of the, the minimum cortical thickness at 1.6 millimeter resolution. And that helps ensure that we can make accurate cortical surface models even in the thinnest cortex. We were at 0.8 for the uh, HCP lifespan projects and uh, uh, 0.7 for the young adult HCP projects. And then tractography, you know, is is always a resolution starved problem. The you know the voxel resolution is always much coarser than than actual axon, so we should just try to maximize diffusion resolution as much as we're able to. That was 1.5 millimeter isotropic um, for the uh, lifespan projects and 1.25 for the HCP yeah. young adult data. So what happens if our spatial resolution is too low? Uh, well, we'll get you know, more mixing across cortical folds um, just due to the, the partial volume effects of the low spatial resolution. You know, this here is a measure of how much of that is going on. So if we think about four millimeter voxels, we've got quite a bit. We still have quite a bit at three millimeter. As we're getting to two and a half millimeter, that's reducing and, and it's, it's almost completely gone at, at uh, two millimeter. 
Um, and if, so if you're at, at these lower resolutions, you really can't tell if an activation is originating from one side or the other of the cortical fold. And those, you know, parts of cortex may be very different, such as, you know, sensory and motor cortex being on opposite sides of the central sulcus. Other things to think about um, uh, in terms of uh, image acquisition, I was mentioning this earlier, you know, we have these 3D high resolution scans, 0.8 millimeter isotropic, and they take a while to acquire. And if somebody moves their head at all during that scan, it can, it can blur the scan. So it really helps to have some internal motion correction, and that can be done with an internal low resolution EPI navigator called the VNAV. And basically what it'll do is, is if the person does move their head, it'll, it'll keep, you know, realign the, the data that, um, the case-based data, and reacquire any, any data that was, was corrupted by head motion. And so even if you have some head motion during these long scans, you can still get high quality scans out of it. So it reduces the need to, um, you know, repeat scans or, or even throw out whole subjects because you don't have high quality structural imaging. Um, other things to think about uh, for functional MRI is, is acquiring fast. Um, in, in this case, we're talking about, you know, one second or less, basically. Um, so we were at 0.8 for the HCP lifespan data, 0.72 for the uh, young adult and original HCP. And that helps us uh, to, to be able to do selective uh, denoising. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later in the talk. That does require this uh, multiband imaging, multiband factor of eight for two millimeter data, basically meaning getting eight slices um, at once or, or multiband six for if we're a little bit more coarse resolution at 2.4. But if we have uh, the high temporal resolution, we're able to remove, you know, artifacts from head motion or, or um, you know, respiration uh, selectively without modifying uh, the signal we're interested in. And then just in general, you know, obviously everybody's got a budget for their study, but you want to get as many minutes of fMRI as you can and, and as many diffusion directions as you can, you know, given the constraints of uh, your population and, and budget and things like that. Um, so uh, phase, in, phase encoding reversed images are very helpful, both for diffusion data and just uh, as uh, what we've termed spin echo field maps uh, that are matched to you know, things like radiant echo fMRI or ASL data. Um, those are really useful both for correcting uh, B0 related distortions, but you know, also in a recent uh, publication, we can use them for uh, mapping uh, the transmit field um, for uh, T1 over T2 myelin map correction. And then we can use multiband EPI for ASL data as well. Um, for, for PCASL data, we can get high isotropic resolution with multiple labeling delays if we use multiband EPI. Uh, some lessons learned in the HCP, you know, what, what, what things that we did that, that I wish we hadn't had done. Uh, it really helps to have pre-scan normalize on for all your scans, for your T1s, your T2s, your fMRI, your diffusion, even your spin echo field maps. Um, it just makes makes the the things you have to correct downstream in terms of uh, image artifacts a little bit easier. Um, we use multi echo MP rage uh, for the um, lifespan studies, and I wish we hadn't. They were end up being more trouble than they're worth. Um, there's some artifacts in those data that uh, led us to to not be able to use them to their fullest potential. And then you know, HCP has been very Siemens set centric. Uh, Siemens was kind of ahead of the curve with the MR technology. Um, but, you know, it's been you know, over a decade since you know, HCP got started and, and the other vendors are starting to catch up, but it's still an ongoing process really getting uh, good harmonization. So how are we going to uh, pre-process this HCP style data to maintain its uh, quality? Um, well, we really want to minimize the blurring that's induced by uh, pre-processing either due to multiple interpolations using uh, blurry interpolation kernels like trilinear or even over uh, smoothing that's commonly done, but maybe not a great idea. Uh, we want to remove the spatial effects of head motion, you know, within and between modalities. Um, Boundary-based registration is, is really good for cross-modal uh, within subject volume registration, basically getting your fMRI data to your, your T1 data or your diffusion data to your T1 data or whatever. Um, you also want to remove all the distortions so that each MRI image accurately represents the physical space of the subject, and then we want to precisely align brains across subjects. How best to do that? Well, HCP proposed a new standard coordinate system that we've termed uh, SIFTI gray ordinates. Uh, it's something different than, than what uh, uh, had come in the uh, previously, like Tallarack coordinates or MNI coordinates. 
And so it's it's basically a standard space that's a combination of cortical surface vertices and, and subcortical volume voxels. It allows us to use sheet-like uh, cortical structures um, to, to uh, align them with surface meshes, um, which, uh, as we'll see in a moment, is, is much better. And we can still use you know, nonlinear methods for globular non-cortical structures uh, in, in the volume. So in the human connectome project, we use a two millimeter average vertex spacing and two millimeter uh, non-cortical voxels. And so that gives us the SIFTI gradient space that we see over here with around 30,000 uh, left cortical surface vertices, uh, 30,000 right cortical surface vertices, around 30,000 uh, subcortical voxels across 10 different structures, and that gives us a total of around uh, 90,000 uh, gray ordinates. And to contrast that with, um, you know, what you would get if you just did a volume-based analysis, you do have over 200,000 uh, data points, many of which um, are not useful for uh, gray matter-focused analyses like fMRI. So how do we accurately align cortical areas across subjects? Well, we can take cortical area MT, the visual motion area, a very famous cortical area as an example here. Turns out a volume-based registration does a terrible job at uh, aligning area MT across subjects. Our best overlap is only 46%, but we've got two sort of disconnected hotspots here of, of uh, overlap probability with a, a traditional 3D volume-based uh, registration. Uh, surface registration uh, works quite a bit better. Um, our overlap goes up a bit, but you know we also have a you know a coherent hotspot here of of overlap. Um, that being said, there are some subjects where you know area MT does not end up in that hotspot. We have several uh, pointed out uh, sort of around it here, and so really we want what I've turned an aerial feature based uh, registration, or or sometimes it's also called a functional registration because it's heavily influenced by um, you know functional features, but basically. We want to use more than cortical folds on the surface to do this alignment. So use things like the architecture of the cortex, like cortical thickness or uh, T1 over T2 myelin content or you know, task activation or resting state functional connectivity or topographic you know, measures either in the task or resting state or even areas themselves um, can generate you know, much better um, alignment of, of cortical areas across subjects. So I talked about this a little bit before, how imaging fast, you know, having a TR of a, you know, one second or less, it really helps to remove artifacts and noise from fMRI data. So many people are probably familiar with uh, functional connectivity, but for those who aren't, you know, we'll, we'll take a, a single point here in the, in the left parietal cortex represented by this uh, white uh, sphere here. We've got a, a schematized time series, um, you know, at that point. And basically we've, we've correlated this time series with the time series in every other part of the brain. If we don't do any data cleanup, um, it's going to look like this. You know, it, it's basically hard to see. You know, it's not very specific. It's kind of like everything's correlated with everything, and it doesn't really look like you know a known uh, functional network. And that's because you know functional connectivity as a technique is very vulnerable to any non-random artifacts in the data, um, you know, producing strong biases. So we can remove artifacts um, from subject motion uh, predominantly using spatial ICA. We can start to see a, a functional network here that looks like the default mode network, um, but there's still, you know, what appears to be a, a global uh, positive bias, you know, in this this data. So if we use uh, temporal ICA to remove uh, respiratory artifacts, uh, global uh, respiratory noise, uh, now we're able to see a much more specific. Um, Functional network here. We can see the anti-correlations, uh, you know, of the uh, task-positive uh, network uh, relative to the default mode network. And then, if we remove uh, random noise, uh, in this case using a technique called Wishart filtering, we've not done spatial or temporal smoothing. We've we've done a PCA-based filtering technique here. We can uh, make a really nice uh, functional connectivity map. Um, so most connectivity studies uh, try to remove uh, artifacts, um, but we really want to do this selectively. We want to remove the noise uh, without changing the neural uh, fluctuations of interest. And it turns out that uh, activation studies really benefit from this too. So if you're removing, you know, the structured noise, that's going to make your, your uh, statistics more significant. And it's also going to remove false positive activations uh, that arise due to correlation between you know, head motion in the task or between respiration in the task, things that actually are quite common and maybe underappreciated. 
But if we're going to have this high spatial and, and temporal resolution MRI, we really need to use the multiband ETI where we're getting more than one slice for each TR. So I'm going to close with this concept of imaging data phenotypes or IDPs. Um, have also been termed imaging derived phenotypes by uh, Carla Miller and Steve Smith and, and the Biobank folks. Um, and the basic idea is to use the brain's structural and functional neuroanatomy to partition measures of interest in a neurobiologically meaningful way. So using things like brain areas or functional networks or white matter tracks. Um, and if we average within these neuroanatomical units, it helps to reduce the effects of uh, random noise, basically improving our statistical sensitivity. And at the same time, because we're taking all these, you know, uh, data points, either voxels or vertices or, or gray ordinates, depending on you know, what kind of an IDP it is, uh, and averaging across them. We're not doing uh, you know thousands of of you know non-independent statistical tests. Uh, you know we're actually doing a much smaller number of uh, statistical tests, and so that improves our statistical power. So we both improve our sensitivity and our power by using imaging data phenotypes to you know organize our our measures. So an example of, of an, you know, one of the uh, kinds of neuroanatomical information you can use to, to organize data as cortical areas. You know, here's the HP's multimodal uh, cortical parcellation. We have our sensory motor areas in green, our visual areas in blue, auditory areas in red, default mode, our task negative uh, network and sort of these darker brown colors here. Um, task positive or anti-default mode um, in the, the whitish colors here. And then, you know, there's some cortical areas are, are uh, kind of in between, you know, different functional systems. So here we have area LIP that has both uh, visual and sensory motor. And so it's kind of an in-between turquoise color. So uh, we can do what we've turned parcelated analysis. Um, so here we have a myelin map. Uh, and so our uh, reds and oranges and yellows are high amounts of myelin. Our blacks and purples and blues are low amounts of myelin. And so we have the aerial borders overlying on uh, the myelin map here. And I can, you know, average the myelin content within each cortical area, um, which I've done here. And you can see that we go from around 50,000 uh, or almost 60,000 data points here down to only uh, 360 data points. But the, uh, you know, the pattern doesn't really change that much. And you can see that it's become discretized by the cortical areas, but otherwise it, it looks very similar to you know, what we started with, but we've done this massive uh, dimensionality reduction. Uh, so we've improved our signal to noise and we've reduced the number of statistical tests that we're going to be doing. We do parcelated analysis with uh, um, other uh, types of uh, data, such as, uh, you know, functional connectivity. Um, so here is a, a, you know, full correlation seed within the um, you know, left inferior parietal cortex here. Here's a partial correlation seed. It's a bit of a sparser pattern, but you know, again, so this is functional connectivity analysis in this framework. You can do task analysis in this framework, though. Here's a um, working memory task. Here's listening to a story. This is uh, a matrix representing the whole battery of, of tasks in the young adult HCP. Um, each contrast has a column here, and so I've just picked out a couple of columns in this matrix to show you guys. We got working memory, gambling, motor, language, social, relationship. A relational uh, emotion, all of these different things. The task data really um, can illustrate this point about improving uh, our sensitivity and power here. So, if we fit our task GLM, you know, to every data point, um, you know, a so-called dense analysis or what people would have traditionally done, they'll get a map that looks like this one at the top for listening to a story. Um, but we can also average the time series within each cortical area and then fit the task GLM, which is what we've got down here in the bottom. And so these are, you know, Z statistics that are scaled the same way. And you can immediately see that the Z statistics are higher in the parcelated approach than in the, the traditional dense approach. If they were the same, you know, these uh, blue dots here would be along this line of equivalence here. But you can see that the, uh, the pattern is, is steeper than the liner of equivalence indicating that basically across the board, it's better to average time series within cortical areas and then fit a task GLM rather than doing it in the other direction. So, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, one type of uh, uh, neuroanatomical organization, cortical areas. Another is functional networks, and that can be done with, you know, hard parcellations or weighted spatially overlapping ones. You know, people have sort of 
mostly done this with, with hard parcellations. Here's an example where they've taken the human cortical areas and, and assigned a functional network to, to each cortical area. Um, but you can also uh, do, do a weighted approach. So here's uh, running a temporal ICA um, using uh, across uh, at the group level, across all the different young adult HCP data types. We've got you know, three Tesla data in the resting state, seven Tesla data in the resting state, traditional tasks at three Tesla, a movie task, uh, seven Tesla, and a retinotopic task here also at seven Tesla. And you can see that the default mode component here, the main default mode component, looks really highly similar across all of these different uh, task states, which is you know, quite interesting. Another approach, uh, other than uh, temporal ICA, is called probabilistic functional modes. So, you know, people have often they've st you know started uh, with these weighted approaches. You know, the first technique that was widely used was spatial ICA, but a limitation of spatial ICA is that all the components have to be spatially orthogonal, and you know, that may not be a great uh, description of, uh, of functional networks if we really want you know there to be, you know, over, overlap uh, between them. Temporal ICA doesn't have that constraint. Now it says that the time series have to be uh, temporally orthogonal. And what that means is that each functional network is basically uncorrelated in time with every other functional network. And so that could be, you know, a good thing or a bad thing, depending on if you believe that's, that's really what's going on. And probabilistic functional modes kind of does away with that um, orthogonality constraint. Uh, and so it may be uh, a better model overall. But, uh, you know, temporal ICA is quite powerful. Not only can it be used for uh, selectively removing global respiratory noise, it can pick out, you know, uh, task activations without, you know, using a uh, uh, task GLM. Here's an example of the uh, 3T uh, task fMRI data from the Human Connectome Project. One of the components here um, pulled out by the temporal ICA and, and then a traditional task GLM analysis. And I would challenge you to, you know, tell me which, which of these is which. They look, you know, really highly similar and the spatial maps are really highly correlated. And in general, you know, we, we think that, that, you know, each cortical area is going to participate in multiple overlapping functional networks to generate uh, specific behaviors. So, um, you know, some of these things are already available by the, uh, to be produced by the HCP pipelines. Other, others are in development, but, you know, we, we want to, you know, have, you know, these imaging data phenotypes, uh, you know, uh, separated by cortical areas, by functional networks, by white matter tracks. You know, we can measure their sizes, you know, just basic sizes of cortical areas, functional networks, or tracks. Uh, we can measure architectural patterns, uh, such as the uh, cortical thickness or, or myelin content within areas or functional networks, uh, functional connectivity could be, you know, area to area, or it could be, you know, these these functional weighted spatially overlapping functional networks. Structural connectivity can be area to area, or can be focused on white matter tracks. Um, we can do task activation, or just the um, the standard deviation of the of the uh, time series, what are known as the fMRI amplitudes. We can do vascular properties in the by areas, networks, or, or, or tracks um, from ASL, or even uh, white matter hyperintensities. So to summarize, acquiring high quality MRI data enables accurate mapping of the brain's structural and functional neuroanatomy. Reprocessing preserves this high data quality and enables localization of measures uh, to the neuroanatomy. And then using the brain's neuroanatomy to subdivide it, the data improves both statistical sensitivity and power. And so this HCP style approach addresses, um, you know, the increased focus and rigor and reproducibly, re reproducibility in, in neuroimaging results. So um, many uh, folks to acknowledge, but I know, uh, I think the first speaker is probably going to take over again before we take questions. Thank you. Yep. Thank you so much, Matt, for a, a wonderful talk. Um, as you mentioned, we will now go back to uh, the first speaker in our session. Uh, we're welcoming back uh, Florian Noll, who will be talking again about uh, fast MRI and accelerating MR imaging using AI. So the floor is back to you. All right. Thank you so much for all the patience with me. I just want to confirm before I start going. Um, do you actually see my slides now? Yes, we can. And they advance, right? They advance, yes. 
<laughs> awesome. Yes. <laughs> Lots of success now. All right. Yeah. Sorry so much for the confusion uh, earlier on, but I'm, I'm great that we, we got this figured out. So I'm Florian. Um, thank you so much for the possibility to speak here. I'm going to give you a bit of an overview about the Fast MRI project and um, just want to First, I mentioned that this was a collaborative project um, with Facebook AI Research, and we also got a grant from Amazon AWS for data sharing. So the background um, of FastMRI, um, as the title already suggests, is about accelerated RMR imaging. And in particular, what we are looking at is the use of neural networks, or more specifically, deep neural networks in the MR image formation process. That meaning that is the stage where we transfer the raw acquired case-based data to a reconstructed image. And in particular, we are looking at accelerated acquisitions. So this is just an example. I'm pretty sure that you all know this or have seen this at one point. Um, these are um, coronal knee acquisitions, and on the left, you see a reconstructed set of images from a full set of case-based coefficients, so um, high resolution, high SNR, no artifacts. And on the right, what you can see, those are corresponding accelerated acquisitions where every fourth case baseline has been skipped, so we have an accelerated acquisition by say a factor of four, but we end up with aliasing artifacts in our images. And our goal now is to train a neural network in this reconstruction process so that we kind of separate out between what the true image content is and what the artifacts are. And we are using the neural network to recover the original image content, even though we have acquired only a fraction of the data. So the way you can um, see it, this or, or design your network training is the following. This is just a high level overview, but you are starting out with your raw case-based data. You are putting it in your neural network and here it doesn't really matter so much what the particular architecture is. The output is a first reconstruction. I mean, this doesn't have to be perfect. It's not going to look great. We haven't really trained the, trained the network yet. And then we are comparing this intermediate reconstruction to our fully sampled ground truth reference that we have available with some kind of similarity measure. And this can be as simple as just the pixel-wise difference between my current reconstruction and the reference. This gives me a reconstruction error map. And now I go back and adapt the parameters of my neural network so that this reconstruction error is minimized. And then I do this for all the examples in my data set, um, minimize the error and thereby train my network to give me the, the optimal correct reconstruction result. So from what you can see from this structure is that this is a setup that Intuitively, you can see that this benefits from very, very large structured data sets um, that, that you can use to train big, big networks. And here are just some of the examples. When we started out doing this, um, this was about five years ago, we actually did not have a, a very, very large data set available. And uh, these were some of our initial results where we compared our particular network approach for image reconstruction to parallel imaging, to parallel imaging and compressed sensing, but already with a fairly small data set of, uh, in total, it was 10 um, cases um, for, for training and then some more for validation and testing, um, we were able to outperform parallel imaging and compressed sensing pretty substantially when it gets to the point of uh, uh, visibility of small image features, signal to noise ratio, removal of aliasing artifacts, and also um, visibility of, of pathology. The issue that I had when this type of research picked up is um, I'm just going to show you a couple of examples from uh, papers and so 
this is um, actually from our own paper, so I'm not pointing fingers at other people, I'm starting with ourselves. So we, we tested our algorithms on data from 10 patients. And here was another one where they had a healthy volunteer. Here's one they had where they had 27 patients, um, training on seven subjects, testing on three subjects, and test error in 10 subjects in, in this particular publication. The, the problem with this for me was that it was impossible when reading these papers to really evaluate what the quality of the research is, because I cannot compare an algorithm that's trained on data set A with another algorithm that's trained and evaluated on data set B. And if they just report their individual results, I have no means telling, oh, was it the new neural network architecture that gave me the improvement? Was it um, some numerical method they used? Was it their great compute hardware? Or was it simply the quality of the data set? So there was just no data set for benchmarking available that um, the entire research community could use, train their methods on, report the errors there, and then we can really do a nice um, apples to apples comparison of the individual approaches um, that were developed. And this lack or, or open need was what motivated the creation of the fast MRI data set. The other question that came up uh, pretty fast after this first initial set of developments in um, machine learning me methods for reconstruction was, are they actually inherently unstable? Do they work in practice? Can there be situations where um, there can be some features or elements introduced to the images so that the methods just completely outright break and give you garbage results? And this was a paper that was published in PNAS and um, got a lot of attention and really pointing out some crucial issues of, of, of these machine learning reconstruction methods. So people at this stage then were wondering, oh, does it actually really work? So this brings me to the fast MRI data set that we put together and where you, um, we started out with muscular skeletal imaging and um, created this set of raw case-based data and paired uh, reconstructed images for um, close to 1400 clinical cases. So in total, this is about 140 gigabytes of data. Um, you see the web page down there, the um, fastmrimat.nwu.edu. You can go there, download the data set. You don't need to fill out any research proposals or anything. You, you, when you uh, click on the register link here, you just get an email with a download link where, where you can get the data. And this we um, hosted or put live uh, first in back in 2018. Just a couple of stats here to show you the size of the data set. Um, as I uh, said, it was or went live first on, on November 26th, um, 2018. And since then, um, we are monitoring the stats and we have about 9,000 unique visitors um, or who download our data per year. And um, this gets us to um, over 900 terabytes of data downloaded per year. And this actually um, brings it to the um, top 10 of all the life sciences AWS data sets um, um, from Amazon. It also does uh, result in a fairly heavy cost that um, needs to be paid because Amazon AWS charges uh, data hosting for file transfer volume. So uh, fortunately, um, because the data set was popular, AWS liked it and they gave us this grant that they are now covering all these costs so the data set can stay there and uh, we don't have to pay uh, $20,000 a month or so just for, for keeping it hosted. We then organized a challenge or two challenges actually. Um, I'm going to talk more about those um, in a second, but I just want to start um, by showing you a little bit of uh, stats here too, just to 
you get an idea of the, the scale of the challenge. So um, we had, um, while the, the actual challenge submissions were running, we had 54 submissions to that and um, to our leaderboard um, starting from 2019, we have uh, over 500 submissions. So it is not a huge challenge if you compare it to the big computer vision um, challenges like, like ImageNet, but um, for a somewhat narrow field like MR image reconstruction, I think um, I, I was pretty happy with these numbers and we have achieved pretty reasonable set of uh, community um, submissions. So what was the goal of the challenge? What um, did we do? First of all, the, the training data that I described, the fast MRI data, that was put out. And then we asked participants um, or for a limited amount of time, we gave them data where we only released the undersampled case-based data without the ground truth. And then what they did after training their methods with the fast MRI data set or any other data sets that they had available, they trained their machine learning models, applied them to the undersampled data that we presented them, got the reconstructions, we compared those to the ground truth reference that we kept um, back and calculated uh, um, a reconstruction error. For example, just pixel-wise difference between reconstruction and reference. Uh, that gave us a leaderboard. And um, then we sent the top entries of the leaderboard to a panel of radiologists for evaluation and that gave us our winners. And we had a total of seven radiologists for this, not just from NYU, but all over the country in the US actually, um, if you wanna see exactly where the affiliations are from, um, they, are, they are in the paper. We had a couple of different tracks and the um, reason for that was that we wanted to cover a couple of scenarios. So first of all, we wanted to have a track where we were going for something that at least I thought would advance the current clinical standard. And that was something that is um, in standard clinical practice, usually people run parallel imaging with an acceleration factor of two. Um, that is pretty widely used. And we wanted to double that and let's say, okay, let's go from a two times acceleration to a four times acceleration with the expectation that this should actually work. And, um, for that, um, yeah, here you just see the number of submissions that we got. Uh, then I wanted to have a track where we really push the models to the limits, kind of see their failure modes, see what happens if you push them beyond what they are supposed to be doing. So this was the idea of the eight times accelerated um, track. And then we had a track where we did not do parallel imaging, but we used uh, single receive coil data um, and doing purely compressed sensing reconstructions there. This is not a particularly clinically relevant uh, problem at this stage because all of our MR scanners are multi coil systems, but we wanted to have something that is um, easier or has a less steep learning curve so that we can reach out to the data science community, the machine learning community, and not just have a, a challenge that is just targeted to the, to the MR image reconstruction community. And what you can see here, um, highlighted one number here, um, we actually got by far the most submissions for the single coil data set. So that means that this really was something where we were able to reach beyond the, the core MR uh, community and uh, got submissions from people who actually know nothing about uh, parallel imaging. Um, this is a busy slide, um, so I don't want to go over it, but I just want to show you um, the timeline so that you get a bit of an idea what happened. So it was about um, a year from the initial release of the data set to the announcement of the results um, from November to December. 
And the participants had about 10 months time to train their models and then um, evaluate the results and submit in the results for the test set. And I want to show you some of the results here. So this was the first um, stage of the quantitative evaluation. Um, we, we used structural similarity as the metric. Um, we also had mean sum of squares, PS and R on there. And what you can see here, first of all, the overall quality of the submissions in terms of structural similarity was actually fairly similar for the top results. And that was the same for each track. And we also saw that if you just look at the absolute uh, numbers, um, structural similarity is uh, better the closer it is to one. Of course, the four times accelerated gave better results than the eight times accelerated, and the multi coil gave better results than the single coil, which also is to be expected. Um, these are some of the results from um, the top contestants. So these are the top four results. And the, the one thing I really want to point out here is what you see on the far right is a parallel imaging compressed sensing reference reconstruction that I did when the challenge was concluded. And I actually on purpose looked at the ground truth results and tried to get the reconstruction as close as possible to the ground truth which is obviously something that the participants did not have available. And I was just really completely blown away by the degree of um, difference between all the deep learning methods and my parallel imaging compressed sensing reconstruction. So this really convinced me of their, of their potential also ultimately to, to go into clinical practice. Um, the one thing what you see here, um, this is uh, just difference maps um, between the individual reconstructions and the ground truth. And the reason I did those was to um, see if there's any particular structure in the um, yeah in these difference maps, if there are any systematic errors or biases that are introduced by the machine learning methods. And as you can see, it's mostly just um, high frequency edge information. So it's a slight amount of blurring that's happening and some random noise. So not really, definitely not more systematic differences than the, the parallel imaging reconstruction. Um, similar result, this is for the eight times uh, accelerated track. There you can see a certain amount of blurring in all the machine learning reconstructions as well. But just keep in mind that this is a almost like insanely high level of acceleration for this 2D um, type of acquisition. And again, they all outperform parallel imaging and compressed sensing by a very, very large margin. Um, however, one thing that you see here is that um, it can happen um, that you do miss important information. So this is a case where there was pathology in um, this example, so this is a meniscal tear, and you can see that it, it's lost in all the, the reconstructions. And not only in the, in, the, in the deep learning reconstructions, also in the parallel imaging reconstruction. So at this point, the data was just accelerated way too much, and it was impossible to get this information back. But what is tricky about deep learning methods, then what we found out is that Visually, they can give you images that kind of look reasonable in contrast to the compressed sensing reconstruction where you just outright see, okay, this is a failed exam and you need to go back and redo it. So this is one of the challenges that I kind of identified uh, for myself for these machine learning methods that we can make their error behavior a little bit more predictable and um, tell the radiologists more like when can they trust the reconstruction and when maybe something is hallucinated and you still miss important features. Um, again, uh, just difference maps and um, very, very similar story to the single coil results. The one thing that I, I wanted to show you is there was this question about um, worst case scenarios. So are there situations where these models can just completely break 
And what I did there was I looked for every, every single track. I looked for the one particular example and even the particular slice where the machine learning reconstructions performed worse. And I wanted to see if there are some pathological, uh, pathological situations where the met methods just completely break. And this also was not the case. So in every single case, the worst possible machine learning reconstruction still outperformed compressed sensing by a very large amount. And you can also see that um, these are not cases or slices where there's some kind of unexpected pathology and that makes the model break or some weird deviation between the training and the test set. These were in general just the examples where the SNR of the exams was lowest. So it was kind of expected that the performance is lowest. So this I found very, very reassuring in terms of the stability and the actual use uh, potential for deep learning methods in clinical practice. Just some error maps here again. Oops. One thing that um, we did then, of course, was the radiologist rating. And there we found out um, that um, in two of the tracks, the single coil and the multi-coil track, there was a clear preference of the radiologists. So what's seen here in blue was the one that um, um, was always ranked best by the radiologists. So here we had clear winners. For the four times accelerated track, um, it was not so clear. And the reason for that was simply that this was a task that was almost too easy. So all the methods performed such great results that the radiologists couldn't tell them apart anymore. So really quickly, just um, talking about the uh, second addition to the fast MRI data set um, after the success of the first one and the first challenge, we added a neuro data set. And this was um, about 7,000 cases um, of uh, axial brain images with multiple contrasts. And for the second challenge, we also introduced the track to go towards this question of uh, how well do the models generalize when they are um, exposed to unexpected situations and when there are deviations between training and test sets. So we caught this um, or designed this thing that we call the transfer track, where we asked people to train deep learning methods on data from one manufacturer and then test it on the data from a different manufacturer. So in this particular case, the training data came from Siemens scanners and the test data was from GE and from, from Philips scanners. You can see from the size of the data set um, that it's now more than 10 times larger than the new data set. And that um, is just because it's, it's a much larger data set. It also makes it harder for people to, to handle it, of course. And actually we had fewer submissions for the second fast MRI challenge uh, than for the first one, just because it was becoming computationally much more demanding than the first one. Um, just showing you some results. I don't want to go into too many details. These are just essentially showcase examples of what, what you can do with the data set. But again, this is an eight times accelerated acquisition. And um, I find it pretty remarkable what type of results the, the group were able to get at, at this level of acceleration um, by using just a very, very large and, and well curated data set. Um, these are some results of the transfer track. Um, one thing that you do see here is that there are models um, where, um, you see this particular example here, um, where there are lots of artifacts. And this was a, a classic case where we were able to test. Um, these are the cases from GE data. And what GE does in contrast to the other manufacturers is that they do not use readout oversampling when they save their raw data. And the Siemens and the, uh, the Philips data, it does that. So that is a almost trivial modification of the data, but it led one of the models to, to break um, because it had never seen this type of data um, during the training. And this resulted in these pretty severe imaging artifacts here. 
So this was an interesting discovery um, that, that we were able to make um, thanks to the data set and, and these transfer tracks that sometimes really, really small and kind of irrelevant details that can cause uh, failure of generalization of deep learning models. Um, I don't want to go so much over this here. Um, this is um, if you are interested in more details uh, about the challenge, about the data set, um, there are several publications um, available, um, one in MRM, one in TMI, one in radiology, AI, um, and uh, there are also resources. Um, all of the source code for FastMRI, um, the um, boilerplate code to load the data, to how the evaluation done, everything is, is open source. It's publicly available um, on, these, on these GitHub repositories. There is a discussion page where you can ask questions about the data set, about submitting to the leaderboard. Um, so all of these are online and, and active. And there is now a new addition to the FastMRI dataset. It's called FastMRI Plus. This was a collaboration with Michael Hansen from Microsoft and Matt Lundgren from Stanford. And they have done something really amazing. They went through the entire FastMRI dataset and um, annotated it with labels, like they created bounding boxes of pathology. So you can see, for example, here, in this knee image on the right, there's a meniscal tear. And um, this is, a, I think, a pretty amazing addition. And it's, I think, one of the powerful things that you can achieve when you open source everything and put your data out, that people actually start contributing to the data and thus enhance the, the value that the data set has for the entire community. So this was a really cool project. Okay, with that, I'm at the end. Um, these big community projects, as you can guess, are always the um, result of uh, not just one person or one group, but of a large number of people from many, many different uh, places. So I just want to thank everybody who contributed to the Fast and My project, to the data collection, to the organization of the challenges and to our funding sources. And um, thanks for um, joining the workshop and uh, looking forward to asking your questions. Yep, thank you so much, um, Corey. And just as a reminder to the audience, please use the, um, the Q&A box to submit um, your questions and uh, we, will, we will pose them to the speaker shortly. Um, I'll, I'll um, get us started with a, a couple while we're waiting for the audience. So you mentioned, um, that you had uh, a radiologist take a look at these images, and I'm hoping um, uh, you can maybe comment on the the advantage or or the added value of having a human um, to kind of take a look at these images as opposed to just looking at the the quantitative metrics that you could also use to compare these different um, different approaches. Yeah, I mean the the, the quantitative metrics are always. Um, um, average metrics, right? So you're always, you're compressing down the information of, let's say, one slice, one volume, or even an entire set of image to one single number. So if you have small deviations in this, in the images, then, so, or, or on the other hand, if you have a very, very subtle change of the intensity of the image, you as a human would not even recognize it, and it doesn't really matter. But um, if this affects every single pixel in the image, you are creating a pretty big substantial deviation if you average this over, over all the pixels, right? But if you have a small feature missing, for example, like this meniscal tear, and this is maybe three, four, five pixels in the entire image, it usually does not show up in the, um, in the quantitative metric, like structure similarity, like uh, um, root mean squared error. And I think we always need to remember that in, in MRI, our goal is to like image human anatomy and, and pathology. And our, the information content of the images has to be whether we can see important features. And that is always hard to cover if you just boil it down to one single number. Yeah. Um, and 
Matt, in your talk, you mentioned um, that the T1 MP Rage, um, you would recommend not using the multi echo version because of some artifacts. Can you comment um, a little bit more on what those artifacts are and what approach you do recommend using for the, for the T1? Sure. Um, so, you know, for the Young and Doll HCP, we just used a single echo uh, T1 weighted image. You know, the, um, the argument for the, the multi-echo is that you can bandwidth match the um, T1, T2 weighted images. Um, but we, you can also correct the readout distortions, and that's something we've had you know, since the young adult HCP. Um, so it, it ended up being a little bit of a, um, a solution in search of a problem. Um, but, but unfortunately, what we then found was that the, the longer echoes um, have artifacts and I'm not I'm not honestly sure if we ever figured out what caused them uh, but basically it, it leads to uh, hyper intensities in the image that um, mess up free surface surface reconstructions and so what we ended up doing was just throwing out the longer of the two echoes and just using the shorter of the two echoes which meant that we lost SNR in these images we would have been better off just sticking with the single echo um, you know, there was some hope that maybe FreeSurfer could come up with a way of uh, dealing with this, but that certainly hasn't happened uh, at this point. And, you know, honestly, it would have been better to just stick with what was already working, in, in my opinion. But uh, we, we uh, uh, that, that's what happened and, and uh, what we did to sort of work around it and sort of stuck with it for, you know, ABC and uh, in longitudinal studies. But you're starting afresh. Single echo, in my opinion, is, is safer. I see. And, and you also mentioned um, mo the multiband imaging as a way to kind of speed up the sequences and also improve the resolution. Can you talk about um, some challenges that that, that may pose uh, from the uh, post-processing pipeline perspective, like uh, any challenges that it poses for, for the fMRI or, or for the ASL data? Um, well, the ASL data, I guess it does pose some challenges as, as you're probably aware um, you know you can get some banding and things like that so um, you know the the Oxford guys you know came up with a, a pipeline to sort of take care of all those issues and and it does a nice job and and, and deals with it uh, from the fMRI perspective I don't really know that there are any particular challenges honestly it just makes um, the denoising work a lot a lot better um, so if you if you image fast it's just a lot easier to uh, distinguish head motion from you know, bold fluctuations using things like ICA. Um, so honestly, it makes processing easier for for fMRI. For ASL, you know, it 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 did lead to some things that that needed to be fixed in processing, but we were able to fix them. So you wouldn't you wouldn't know you know after the fact that you'd use multiband to right. take care of these things. And I guess um, kind of a, a larger question that I'll post to to, to both of you is just um, from this from this perspective of a faster um, MRI and and using um, AI, are there um, things that could be uh, better integrated, or can can both kind of the acquisition um, inform the the post processing and then the other way around as well? Do you see any uh, avenues or opportunities to, to kind of integrate the two a bit better um, for either of you? Well, um, certainly, I, I think you benefit from considering acquisition you know, and, and analysis together. Um, you know, I, I sort of an, am an imaging analysis methods person and a neuroanatomist, but um, I end up spending a lot of time thinking about how to get the right images and, and the images that have the right resolution, you know, space and time and, and all that, um, because it, it, it really does affect things. From the perspective of, you know, deep learning reconstructions, you know, I guess, you know, for me as, as also a neuroradiologist, I, I always wonder, you know, how how will they perform when when the rare you know finding shows up that you know might not be in the training data set? So that's probably more of a, a Florian <laughs> a question. To Florian, how do we you know how do, how do we how do you give you know a, a clinician confidence that you know we didn't uh, uh, we didn't remove too much when we were accelerating and and uh, and then when something rare comes up that that it's going to be our results are going to be uh, trustworthy. So the yeah, that's of course the, the one question that everybody wants to know, right? So the the rare finding is actually not an issue. So we we had cases in the fast MRI data set where we had 
severe abnormalities in the test set that we did not have in the training set. This can either be pathologies or um, for the MSK images, it was mostly things like screws, implants with really, really huge um, um, like deviations from how you would a normal would expect a normal knee to look like. And that did not cause any issues in, in any of the models. And the reason for that is that the reconstruction problem is not a, a diagnosis problem, right? So it doesn't really train specifically how does a meniscal tear look like or how does a brain hemorrhage or, or something look like. It's, it's, it's essentially learning the physics of the inversion of, of this matrix. And this is to some degree agnostic to the image content. What you usually need to know and um, where mo models are very susceptible to, at least the ones that I know, is simply SNR. If you have a substantial mismatch in SNR between training and testing, that throws the models off. But that you can either get rid of um, during the training. If you train with multiple different levels of SNR, then you, you can do this. Or just make sure that you train a model on 70, and when you uh, go to 3T, you, you train different model where, where you have a different SNR level. So that, that was the part about the rare findings. You had another question, right? Um, well, I mean, just to follow, follow that up, though, like, you know, let's imagine that your training data set, you know, you had flare images. Your training data set didn't have images that had non-suppression of flare in the skull side, which is an important clinical finding, and it's pretty subtle, actually. It's not, you know, something obvious like metal somewhere. It's it's a subtle finding. You know, would would uh, would the model be able to pick up on the fact that you, you know, you have, you know, some inflammation or some pus or something in, in the cortical folds that's leading to the to the signal not to suppress, or would something like that get glossed over, you know, for example? So, I think this is fine. I mean, we haven't tried it with this particular example, but one thing, for example, where actually we, we have a paper out was for, again, for musculoskeletal training on um, images without fat suppression and applying it on images with fat suppression, which is completely changes the contrast. And um, if you then match the signal to noise level of the two, the models work just fine. If the signal to noise level is off, um, then 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 you run into issues. So the contrast, or let's say changes, let's say from a flare to, to a slightly different contrast, those are usually not so much of an issue. Um, the, the the other question now, remember what you asked is, when do you know that you have confidence, and when when does it go wrong? I think this identifying this operating point, how far you can push it. This is really a key task, and this is something that we need to figure out as, as a research community. In general, things go wrong if you get greedy, right? I mean, if you if you go from if you if if you stay modest and go, let's say, from a two times acceleration to a four times acceleration, things do work pretty well. You outperform compressed sensing and still get reliable results. But then if you want to push it further and say you want to do 40 times, 50 times acceleration or so, then, then the neural networks, they have no data to work with anymore. And they have to start to invent. They, what they're going to do is start interpolating information from the training data. So they are, they, they are not magic, right? So they, if they have no data to work with, they, they, they need to create the information from somewhere. And there are actually a lot of, research works um, underway where people um, try to characterize the, the the variability, the uncertainty that the networks introduce, like how sure are they when they reconstruct a certain image. Um, that is one area of research, but then in the end, I think there's no doubt about that we need to do clinical evaluation studies um, where we really see do we find the, the correct pathologies and, and um, or do we lose them? I think there's just no replacement for this. Well, thank you both again for your, for your talks and that wonderful discussion. Um, I think we will move on to the second half of the session. Um, and the first speaker in the second, second half of the session um, will be a talk entitled Whole Brain Connectome Diffusion Project, given by 
Fuji Wan from the Martino Center at MGH and Harvard Medical School. So with that, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, can you share my screen? Um, can you see my slide? Yes, we can. You can? We can. Okay, great. Um, um, thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting me and for the introduction. And uh, I think today I'm going to talk about in vivo um, sub, sub millimeter resolution, whole brain connectome diffusion MRI. And my name is Bui Zhuan, and uh, um, I'm a faculty member at Martino Center. So um, this is an outline. Um, can you see the next slide? Yes, we can. OK, great. Um, uh, so this is the outline of um, the talk. And I'm first going to give in the introduction to the open data set that we acquire at set millimeter resolution um, in Babel Diffusion MRI, and then talk about how the application of the data set and also uh, some recent technical development to that can um, you know, help uh, advance and get better uh, data um, in the future. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to start with the introduction to the open data set. So we acquired um, um, this high quality in vivo human connectome diffusion MR data set at uh, set millimeter resolution. And the goal is to um, obtain detailed information of brain's fine scale structures. And however, it's um, it's very challenging to acquire high resolution in Babel diffusion MRI uh, because of the inherent low SNR of smaller voxels, um, also because of the distortion of learning artifacts due to the lengthy PI readout, um, and also motion sensitivity during the long scan time. So um, the typical resolution of diffusion MRI is around like 1.5 or 2 millimeter um, resolution. So uh, we create this open and public available um, data set uh, with high resolution at some 60 micron. And the goal is to um, help and aid in the exploration of detailed structure in, in Babel diffusion MRI and also help um, uh, to, uh, you know, this data set can also serve as a test bed for further development of uh, new uh, modeling or denoising or processing algorithm for high resolution diffusion MRI. So um, the data um, is, uh, you know, made possible by using state-of-art hardware and also acquisition techniques that can improve the um, SNR to enable the higher spatial resolution. And this includes um, the, you know, 3T connectome scanner with uh, strong gradients and a custom-built 64-channel phase array that could provide better spatial encoding for higher SNR. Um, and we're also using uh, uh, you know, a new acquisition technique, uh, G-Slider SMS, that combines uh, simultaneous multi-slab with the novel RF encoding method to obtain high isotropic resolution diffusion MRI uh, with additional SNR gain of around square root of 10. So using this technique, our, uh, this data was acquired in a multi-session acquisition on healthy subject. And um, so, in this way, we can uh, ensure the high SNR and also ensure that there's high angular resolution. And um, our data was acquired uh, in nine two-hour sessions, and that results in the uh, you know 14.5 hours of diffusion acquisition at um, at 760 micron isotropic resolution with whole brain coverage, um, and also stru structure scans like uh, MPP range and also T2 weighted images are also provided. Um, as well as the, the field maps. So the diffusion images um, are acquired uh, in you know, two shells at B value of 1,000 and 2,500. And uh, these directions have been designed to provide not only overall uniform distribution, but also incremental angular uniform distribution. So you can take any subset of the data and still have a uniform distribution. And data was acquired with reverse based encoding to correct for the distortion. Um, 
and uh, also with uh, together with the Bezerra images, we acquire a total of 2,800 volumes. Um, we also carefully designed the imaging protocol um, so that um, after like extensive evaluation and also pilot and prior studies, um, and we kind of use 5G solder RF encoding volumes uh, with a you know multiband uh, you know two uh, that enable acquisition of 10 slices per shot to provide an SRI efficiency um, gain of a square root of 10. Um, and also some implant acceleration was used to reduce uh, distortion and blurring, especially at this um, high resolution um, acquisition. So um, to ensure the consistent subject positioning and to reduce motion contamination in the data, uh, we use a personalized motion stabilizer that fits uh, precisely with the shape of the head of the subject and also the inside of the coil. Um, if you look at the subject movement um, of this data set, uh, you know, in my uh, sessions, and these are three translations and three um, rotations, um, and uh, these are different sessions, um, and in total about 18 hours of data. And we can see that because of the use of this, uh, you know, custom made, uh, you know, form head case, we can see small, um, most of these um, motion parameters are very small within like plus and minus 0.5 millimeter or degrees. And uh, we see some of the, you know, the rotation around left, right axis is slightly higher um, because the, you know, um, the head case uh, give a little bit of flexibility in that way. Uh, and for the, you know, translation along phase encoding direction was also a bit higher and fluctuates because it not only include uh, the motion, um, but also include eddy current component. However, um, you know, and, and also for uh, cross session, we can see some, you know, abrupt changes, um, you know, because of the, you know, different subject, slight different subject positioning and relocalization. But overall, it was still kept small within uh, plus and minus two millimeter or degrees. Uh, due to the use of this head case, and which is important, um, you know, during the acquisition um, of this, you know, high resolution uh, data set. So um, this is how we process the data to ensure the high quality. Uh, we use improved reconstruction and optimized data processing, um, including the dual polarity graph plot for improved API goals correction that take into account higher order uh, phase differences uh, uh, to improve the, you know, ghost correction, and also POX, um, POX for partial Fourier reconstruction to preserve high spatial resolution information, uh, and then real value, uh, uh, you know, diffusion to remove magnitude noise bias, um, and also to, you know, using like a reconstruction that incorporates slab profile to correct for um, potential bias as well. And after reconstruction, the data was, uh, you know, uh, processed, uh, um, processed um, um, to correct the, you know, normalize the intensity and the signal drift, and also, you know, distortion, eddy current, and gradient nonlinearity and motion. And that's all done in a one step resampling uh, process to minimize. Uh, to minimize additional uh, blurring due to interpret interpret uh, interpolation, um, similar to the you know the H HCP processing um, pipeline. So um, ne uh, so next I'm going to show uh, some of the results to show the quality of this data set. So um, first we're looking at the single uh, DWI and mean DWI at uh, two different B values. And we can see high SNR and also high image quality without obvious uh, ghosting or reconstruction artifacts on the images. And also the high spatial resolution provided um, uh, detailed structures information. And then the high SNR uh, that we um, that we get from this multi-session acquisition um, can help um, you know we can see the highest NAR by 
you know, using this multi-session data. And these are the FA maps obtained from different subset of the data set in one session and three session and nine session. And we can see the nine session data show much higher SNR and reveal um, very detailed uh, fine structures like radiating fibers uh, within the cor corpus callosum and also the gray matter bridges that um, span the internal capsule and also the, you know, we can see this thin lie that's kind of separating the tract um, uh, you know, next to them, like uh, separating the cortical spinal tract and the adjacent tract that highlight the, uh, you know, the low level blurring and high spatial accuracy um, of this data set. So um, the high SMR and high angle resolution provided by this multi session data set can also improve resolving uh, crossing fibers and uh, and also review uh, you know the complex fiber architecture. Here's an example of you know different subsets of data that are you uh, you know uh, one session, three session, nine session, and uh, show where the fiber orientation maps uh, within the central Samuel Valley. Um, and we can see that uh, much more uh, third third way crossing fibers are resolved. Uh, by using more and more data, and uh, and uh, that's that's due to the improved SNR and also the improved angular resolution uh, from this multi-session acquisition. And finally, um, here show the high spatial resolution uh, enables the visualization of detailed structures. Uh, for example, uh, this is a comparison of uh, different you know the FA maps of different resolution. Um, you know, these are downsampled data um, at 1.5, 1.25, uh, and one millimeter uh, data uh, resolution. And we can see that the, you know, the sub resolution can reveal more detailed structures and fiber bundles in internal capsule and also in the, you know, brain step. And it also, uh, you know, leads to a better depiction of cortical, um, um, uh, you know, cortical um, anisotropy um, shown here, uh, which highlights the capability of high, higher spatial resolution uh, data set to visualize the sub, um, subcortical white matter as it turns into the, the cortex, uh, and also to visualize the short association fibers uh, connecting adjacent cortical regions. And finally, the high spatial resolution data set also provide reliable radiality across different cortical depth uh, with higher values in the middle depth surfaces and with a stripe of lower values in the motor and sensory cortex, showing the capability of capturing um, sharp turning features across uh, you know, cortical depth. Um, so uh, this is the... Um, Introduction to uh, the data set that we require at uh, high resolution. Uh, then I'm going to briefly talk about like how the data can be useful in different applications to look at the uh, you know detail uh, brain structures. And here's the um, results of our collaborator co collaborator Dr. Kira and Anastasia, and they look at uh, using this data set to visualize uh, you know small um, you know, brain connections, um, like shown here. This is the data that they, they at 1.5 isotropic, and this is the, you know, the submillimeter resolution data. And we can see some tracks are uh, only partially or not reconstructed in the lower resolution data, um, such as uh, this uh, mammalothalamic track, and, and also the uh, fasciculus retroflexus uh, track shown here. And uh, this shows the high resolution data can help the, with the, you know, looking at the connect, you know, connectivities of um, this, you know, small bundles. We also compare, you know, how uh, the, you know, the looking at the track uh, agrees with the histology, and these are shown with the MRI images and the histology um, sections, and. Uh, um, we can see that uh, they have like a um, 
a strong agreement with the between the outlooks and between what they get from the this high resolution data set. They also look at how um, how much data set are um, you know are you, you know enough or um, can be used to reconstruct these tracks with high accuracy, and they take uh, you know. Uh, more and more data set from this multi-session acquisition and look at the reconstruction of the tract. And they see that with uh, 7.5 hours, uh, you know, uh, using 7.5 hours of data, and they can see, um, you know, good accuracy with a, a dice coefficient of higher than 60%. But with reducing the, uh, you know, uh, the data amount, uh, we can see the reconstruction accuracy is uh, diminished and reduced. Um, that shows that the SNR and, you know, the SNR of the data is also important to uh, look at these, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, small bundles or connectivities. And these are other examples of using the, uh, you know, this high resolution wave of data um, to provide opportunity to Look at the cortical or or subcortical connectivity in the human brain. Um, these are um, a lot of nice work done by many other groups using this data set to investigate, you know, subcortical nuclei and connectivity or pathway in various um, brain processes, um, which could be all like potential targets for uh, neurolog uh, you know, many neurological diseases. So finally, I um, I just want to give like a um, uh, talk about the recent technical development um, to help, you know, that can help us to obtain better data set in the future. Um, you know, uh, and to, to get higher quality uh, or higher data quality or spatial resolution, uh, we're developing new acquisition techniques um, so to get uh, distortion free, high SNR and uh, motion robust diffusion of our data. And this is achieved by uh, a technique we call Romer EPTI, and that um, includes EPTI encoding, and that encodes, you know, like a spatial temporal space, so we can get just, uh, you know, distortion-free images, um, and that's, you know, combined. You know, and and this encoding can enable a very flexible readout that can achieve like minimal TE. Uh, right after the diffusion encoding, and also achieve optimal readout length to achieve additional, you know, 30 to 40 percent SNR gain. And finally, this is combined with the rotating view motion robust super resolution acquisition. That's kind of we're, we're acquiring like these kind of thick slices and rotate it in the you know slice and readout plan. And because of these volumes are acquired using EPTI encoding. They're, they have no geometric differences due to motion or field changes. They're also self-navigated uh, for the motion. So we can uh, reconstruct high astrotropic resolution volume that's robust to, that's, that not only give like overall uh, a high, very high SNR efficiency, but also distortion-free, um, robust to motion of phase, and also, you know, minimal or no striking artifacts in both are and low SAR that we can move to ultra high field. So the, here are some preliminary results that we've, we've been a bit able to get using this new technique. Um, um, the, the high SR gain of this technique is very helpful in the, you know, SR starving applications such as, uh, you know, you know, such as the high, uh, you know, spatial resolution diffusion MRI. And we've been able to acquire data at 500 micron um, at 3T um, using this technique and moving to 70, we've been able to get higher SNR. Um, uh, uh, moving to 70, we've been able to get higher SNR and better data. Um, another application would be to, uh, uh, to you know, obtain high SNR microstructure imaging. Uh, for example, uh, the high SNR gain uh, provides significant uh, benefit for high B value diffusion MRI. Here's an example where, um, you know, it's a B value of uh, 5,000 um, and uh, with a time match acquisition, our technique can provide significantly higher, you know, uh, SNR or image, uh, image signal compared to conventional EPI. Um, and that also, um, in it, you know, enable 
you know, very good quality data in a short, you know, 30 minutes scan whole brain uh, and with, uh, you know, five diffusion time to observe like clear time dependent um, information um, by looking at this uh, data set. So this is an um, example of uh, how we can, you know, use acquisition to uh, obtain like better data quality with minimal artifact distortion free so that it, we can look at these, uh, we can look at challenging brain areas that we've uh, not been able to look at before. And also the higher SMR uh, game that's going to provide much more efficiency and better data um, in the future. And also by, you know, combining the acquisition with, uh, you know, advanced, uh, you know, hardware like connectome scanner can now also enable uh, better, you know, open data set uh, for the community. So um, to conclude, I, I guess for this talk, I really want to introduce to you guys this high quality, you know, seven-member diffusion MR data set that we acquired um, at 760 micro strawberry resolution. Um, and also we this data set, we are using this multi-session scan um, that enable high SNR and also um, high angular resolution in addition to the SR game that's being uh, able to provide it using the new uh, hardware and acquisition. Um, and, and we've shown that this high spatial resolution has been able to reveal more detailed structures and complex fiber architecture uh, in, in vivo diffusion MI. Um, and also we uh, also like, um, uh, you know, talk about like a further new, uh, you know, acquisition that's been uh, that's able to provide even better data in the future and, you know, provide, um, you know, look at the uh, you know, detail structure or microstructure uh, in better, you know, ways. And uh, thanks for uh, my colleagues and also thanks for the funding sources. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I think I'm just going to... Yeah, sure. thank, thank you, Fuxia, for um, the great talk. Um, we will move on to the um, last talk of the session, uh, which will be given by Julie Boyle from CRI UGM, who will be speaking about the challenges of uh, open science uh, and neuromod perspective. Can uh, everybody see my slides or is that? We can see them, yes. You can see them, okay. So uh, first, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm, uh, I feel like I'm in very good company or Neuromod's in very good company um, and uh, I'm definitely learning a lot about data sets and the data sharing and definitely Neuromod is perhaps one of the younger data sets. Uh, so it was very useful for me to be part of this panel. So thank you. So today I'm going to talk to you about challenges of open science, at least the Neuromod perspective of it. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some work that's been done mostly by the entire team. But in particular, uh, my colleague, Basit Pensal, who's our data manager. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, so I just want to give him a shout out. So in terms of outline, I'm going to give you a general overview of just the Kofton Neuromod project and what it's about. And I'm going to give you an overview of the data set and the type of data acquisition that we do. Um, and then I want to take a second to talk about the challenges related to data preparation and release, um, because we are, I think, one of the largest uh, imaging data sets out there, if not the largest. Um, then I'm going to quickly touch on some preliminary modeling results and then some general conclusions. So what is the Courtois Nehamad project? The Courtois Nehamad project is a community-based brain observatory, so to speak. Uh, we have three main goals. One is to create a community-based deep uh, neuroimaging data bank that probes numerous cognitive domains. And uh, there's two really important words in there, the community and deep. And I'm going to come back in a few minutes and talk to you about what the, I guess, to explain the meaning of both of those terms. Uh, we also would like to create data sets to be able to train artificial networks on an individual, on individual human brain activity and behavior. And uh, lastly, but also equally important, uh, which has been a big challenge, to share that data with the larger community, not just within the Kultuan Nehamad community. Uh, when I 
mean about community, in fact, is um, because Neuromod is a multi-domain data bank or data set that encompasses things like audition, vision, emotions, video games, memory, and language. Very quickly, when we started the project, we realized that if we want to build high quality data sets um, for the imaging community, uh, we were unable to have that expertise within one lab. So what we did is we reached out to other like-minded um, neuroscientists who are interested in building individual brain models, um, who are already experts in their independent fields. So people like Martin Hubbard in vision, Leila Webby in language, uh, Guillaume Lajoie, who does uh, memory in, in AI. And we asked them to come together and help us put this data set together. So that's, this is an, so I think we're complete, somewhere around 50 people all over the world currently contributing to Neuromod. Um, the other term that I would like to specify um, is the word deep. That's the word I used. And Neuromod at its core is a mega individual sample. So we only have an N of six people uh, who we scan intensively. And in order to put kind of in context what we mean by deep MRI or intensive scanning, uh, this figure by Nasalaris, in fact, that um, is from the Natural Scenes uh, dataset paper is a really great figure. What you see on the y-axis is uh, essentially what you see is all sorts of other uh, fMRI data sets that have been shared throughout the year. On the y-axis, you see the number of subjects, and on the x-axis, the hours of fMRI data per subject. On the upper left-hand corner, you have a data set like the UK Biobank, where you have a couple hours of scans, but hundreds of thousands of participants. On the bottom uh, right-hand corner, you have the natural scenes data set, where you have eight participants, but about 40 hours of data per participant. And they very kindly included us in this graph. Um, when you're a young data set, it's always nice to get shout outs. Um, so we're somewhere off the x-axis. This doesn't really do justice of where we stand. So one of the things we like to do is extend the axis to give you an idea, for example, of where we stand today. So at the moment, we currently have about 175 hours of fMRI data per subject, uh, which is a lot of data. Um, and uh, to give you an idea of where we hope to go in the next couple of years, essentially we're hoping to reach somewhere closer to 350 hours of usable fMRI data, which would be close to 500 hours of actual acquisition time. So now I'm going to talk to you about the data itself. I think that's the, always the fun bit. So the data acquisition. So the general inclusion criteria for our participants, as you can imagine, were not too strict. Um, they need to be generally healthy. They needed to be MRI and MEG compatible. They needed to have normal hearing for their age, just to be able to hear the stimuli in the scanner. A solid comprehension of the English language. We're in Quebec, so we definitely have a lot of Francophone participants. We needed participants that could hear, uh, that can understand English. And most importantly, they needed to be willing to scan, to be willing, they needed to be willing to be scanned one and a half to three hours per week for at least five years. So, Miraculously, we managed to find six people that were happy to undertake this journey with us. We happened to have half women, half men. Uh, age varied at the time of recruitment between 31 and 47. People happened to be right handed This was not an inclusion criteria. And as you can see, we have a variety of uh, maternal languages. We have natural francophones, we have bilingual participants, and we have one, at, um, one anglophone. Each one of those participants uh, undergoes intensive scanning regime. One of those regimes is an MRI data acquisition where we acquire structural, quantitative, and spinal uh, cord data. Um, they're scanned on the, on the, on the MRI acquisitions, on the, on the structural acquisitions. They're scanned uh, four times per year, so once every three months, and uh, on a variety of types of scans. So here, this is a figure put together by Mathieu Boudreau from Julien Conadad's lab from an abstract that he submitted uh, to ISMRM um, and that kind of outlines the main, uh, the main structural sequences we've acquired. We also acquire a lot of fMRI data. So we definitely uh, have learned a lot about fMRI. We, all the data we acquire is on the 3T scanner, same as the anatomical, the, three, the 3T Prisma fit scanner, the Siemens. Uh, participants um, are, are essentially we, we uh, participants hear sound through a sensometric S15 system. Uh, we use an eye tracker on most of our data sets to be able to track uh, pupillometry and eye tracking. Um, uh, we also, while participants are in the scanner, acquire an assortment of physiological recordings using Biopack, including ECG, pulse, respiration, and skin conductance. Any type of response we need from the participants in the scanner, we use a custom-built video game controller. 
you want more information about that, I'm happy to provide. It was built in-house. And uh, we also use uh, case forge head cases uh, to help stabilize the head and also keep the head in the same position for multiple scans. Uh, we've replicated this setup minus the eye tracker in the MEG, definitely a challenge of ours. I think that's a challenge of most MEG centers to stay open. But before the end of the project, <laughs> we will get there. In terms of data sets, um, I did say that we'd like to acquire multimodal data sets. Um, we have vision data sets, uh, audition data sets, emotion data sets, video games, memory, and language. Uh, we even have some HCP, uh, uh, the HCP tasks that we've repeated 15 times that we call HCP TRT. Um, in terms of vision localizers, we have vision localizers, we have language localizers. Uh, we have lots of video games. We're big fans of video games here at Neuromod. So we have Shinobi, Mario, Super Mario, Mario Stars, uh, with the idea that we're going to use those data sets to be able to look at stuff like transfer learning. Um, so when you start acquiring this type of data, very quickly you run into uh, uh, some challenges. And because the data set itself is about 10 terabytes, um, so, and it's coming off the scanner, three hours per participant. So that's 18 hours a week. We have fMRI data coming off the scanner. We have biopack data coming off the scanner. We have eye tracker data coming off the scanner. And very quickly, we realized that we needed to have a, system, a systematic way of dealing with the data. So how do you acquire a large quantity of data while maintaining like, quality and reproducibility? So in terms of data acquisition, uh, we leaned heavily on open source software. Uh, one of the main things is we utilize automated scripts for stimuli acquisition. So we rely as little as possible on tired, work, overworked academics and particular students. Uh, we use open source software. We use Pupil for the eye, Pupil for the eye tracker. We use PsychoPy for the stimulus presentation and Jim Retro for the presentation of the video games. Um, we also rely on software uh, dev tracks like uh, Git Issues for PRs. And one of the really important things at the beginning of this project was that we relied heavily on FAIR principles as a guide. And I can't say enough if anybody's trying to put together a data set, uh, check out the INCF website. Um, it has lots of useful information on uh, guidelines and community guidelines to follow for open data. A second big challenge for us was how to prepare and organize the data in a reliable and robust manner to be able to share it with the community at large. And thankfully, um, again, there's a whole bunch of neuroinformatics technologies that exist out there. Um, one of the main questions we wanted to answer was, uh, can we essentially select technologies that help us produce fair and open data sets on a constant basis? Um, and yeah, so we relied on bid structure. I think this is pretty standard now, but when we started Neuromod, it was just at its beginning. Data Lad, which also when we started in Neuromod, I guess four years ago, this was at its beginning. And this definitely, Data Lab uh, combined with Git and Git Annex helps us track file changes, release preparations and maintenance, robust provenance, which is important, reproducibility tools and hierarchical data sets. We use BIDS apps because we use a FMR, we also use the FMR prep LTS and we use Docker for containerization. Um, so another important challenge, so now we've acquired the data, we've organized the data, was how do we share our data openly? And uh, it's not something I've heard other speakers, and perhaps it's because most of the speakers are in the US, but we're physically located in Canada, and particularly in the province of Quebec. So we've definitely come across some major hurdles on how to get the data shared. Um, and I put openly in quotations uh, because it's been a long journey, and I don't think the data is fully open, or at least open as much as we want. Currently, all the Neuromod data is available through registered access, or at least a big chunk of it. I think we're doing another release this week. So you need to be a principal investigator or PI at a university. You need to go online at cneuromod.ca, fill out a short blurb about the type of research you'd like to do. Then an internal committee uh, looks over your, your short blurb to make sure that it's congruent with uh, what participants have consented to. And then uh, the institutions can sign the data transfer agreement, which is not always very efficient, but it's a slow process. And then we can give you access using S3 credentials and support is implemented as GitHub issues. Now, some of the major issues that we've come across to be able to put our data fully open is really at the moment is provincial laws here in Quebec. So this probably doesn't apply to everybody in the audience, but it certainly applies to Quebecers. Um, at the moment, those laws are in the process of getting changed and pushing more towards proper open uh, data. Um, 
Uh, but definitely ethics boards, our ethics board was very reluctant and already the registered access that we got um, was not exactly what they wanted. We actually had to push back at some point, hired a couple lawyers to take on our own institution. And so, yeah, so between our institution who wanted to maintain uh, intellectual property, even on derivatives of the data and her ethics board that wanted to people to submit a full ethics application. It's a very long journey. Thankfully, we have a very incredible funding partner, La Fondation Courtois, which is an ally in open science. And uh, we were able to leverage that to be able to eventually get in registered access. This, we, this battle is not over. We're continuing to fight it. And hopefully soon you'll be able to find Neuroma data fully open um, in the not so distant future. Um, since this is a, um, a, a session on applications, I want to touch briefly on, on uh, some of the stuff that we're working on in the lab. Um, and in particularly the um, essentially uh, brain encoding models. Um, so using the, the Neuromod data set to build different types of brain encoding models. And again, you see this, um, this figure and um, pretty much with the exception of emotions, the emotional domain, because we haven't yet acquired data, we've been able to build different types of encoding models, be it for vision. So Sana has done that on the friends data set. Maria Teneva has done this also using the hidden figures data set that we have, or it's a repetition of hidden figures and it's been published. Mel has used the sound. So she's built um, a sound uh, model, essentially using the sounds from the Friends data set. So from five seasons of Friends. Um, Pravish has used the HCP TRT data uh, and has built a, a memory model. And Anyhood has used uh, some Shinobi data from the video game data that we've had has been able to build a model. And most of this is either in prep or is has just been released. And you can find these models on a bioarchive. So some general conclusions or some general take home messages um, on the Courton Neuroma data set. So we've built the largest functional neuroimaging database collected on individuals. I think we can probably claim that at the moment. Um, and what we hope is that this opens an avenue to the entire neuroimaging community to build AI models of integrated processes of the brain, not only in one cognitive domain, but probably a, hopefully across multiple cognitive domains. This is definitely something we're working on in the lab pretty aggressively. And um, this is not to say, of course, there's a whole bunch of other data that we are, we're working on. We're working on the, the, um, the, bio, the physiological data and the eye tracking data too, and all that should be released very soon. Um, one last uh, push, if you're interested in any of the Neuromod data, or if you have questions, definitely go to cneuromod.ca. You can actually go through the registered access. If not, uh, hopefully in the next following months, you'll be able to find some of the Neuromod on the open platforms, probably the CONP platform. Um, we're also, a, we're still on Twitter <laughs> for how long, I don't know. Uh, you can reach us on GitHub, and you can also reach us on our email, kofwa.neuromod at gmail.com. Some acknowledgements, um, obviously our, the, the, the foundation that gave us the funds to do this project, the entire Neuromod community, and it's a pretty large community, way more people than we're on that slide. The subjects through some miracle show up week after week to be scanned for another year and a half plus. I think we're looking to possibly extend for another five years. Um, and the scanning crew, the scanning team that scans them who do the one-to-one -one in the scanner with them. So thank you very much for your attention and for inviting me. Thank you again for the, the talk, Julie. Um, and a reminder for the audience, please use the, um, the Q&A box to, to ask your questions of the speakers. Um, I'll start with uh, a couple. Uh, first is just a, a clarification question. Um, these, these individuals that are being scanned on a week-to-week -week basis, are you, are you acquiring both structural and functional data at all of these time points? And are the, no. kind of the stimuli, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, so um, sorry, I should have let you finish the, the sentence, sorry. But, the first half of that is we don't acquire on a week to week basis. So three hours a week, um, we acquire fMRI. And once every uh, three months, we acquire full functional session. That's all of those parameters. In fact, it's an hour and a half of functional sessions from diffusion to spinal cord. Yeah, or at least at the beginning of the spinal cord. Yeah. yeah. yeah and, and the second half of that question is just going to be, do you, do you change kind of the, the paradigms that you're acquiring at, at the functional runs or you keep that? Of consistent um, from functional run to scan as well. Uh, I'm not sure I understand that question. So I guess. Well, you, you, yeah. So I was just going to say. Uh, so you mentioned you you were using a, diff, um, a number of different um, visual stimuli. Uh, uh, do you keep that part consistent from scan to scan? Yes. 
from scan to scan, obviously, each participant does all of those stimuli, so it can't remain. Uh, but uh, we do sometimes mix stimuli. So we uh, we tend at the beginning we used to do uh, one hour and a half per and with one type of stimuli. Um, we we've, we've learned something at Neuromod, which is there's more stimulating stimuli and less stimulating stimuli. Um, and definitely we've uh, we try and pair more cognitive, maybe less fun tasks at the beginning of a run. So we'll do like a shorter session of 30 or 40 minutes and then we'll pair it with something fun like Mario or watching friends or watching movies at the end. Keep people awake. Make sure we get that good SNR at the beginning before they fall asleep. Right, thank you. Um, and regarding the, the diffusion talk, Pichet, you mentioned um, near the end there that you were looking into doing that as 7T um, as well. And um, uh, I guess I'm wondering, uh, would you, if you went to higher field, would you we can reduce the, the scan time to be able to get a comparable SNR, or would you kind of scan these individuals for the same number of hours and try to take advantage of a higher SNR? Yeah, uh, thanks for the, the question. Yeah, um, yeah, we are moving to 7T, and uh, we, we do see this, you know, um, higher SNR uh, when we move to 7T, and also because of the, you know, the, you know, the, the flexibility of that weight out being able so we can use like a minimal TE so that SNR gain at 70 um, is, uh, you know, is, is good. And so with that, um, but there's also several challenges at 70, the, the higher B0 um, that could, um, in, in our, you know, KT uh, reconstruction can, um, can, can induce, uh, you know, slightly higher noise amplification during the reconstruction uh, and also the B1 issue. So, um, so um, I think, you know, but with that, we, you know, parallel transmission would be the next step for us. Um, I think um, generally, um, I guess uh, to answer your question, there is, um, uh, you know, SNR in, in our like preliminary data. So uh, that means we could potentially use uh, that SNR gain to reduce the, you know, scan time or to, um, or to, you know, you know, improve the spatial resolution we've uh, we've been able to get um, at three T. Uh, but again, there's still a lot of challenges to at seven T to address, including the SAR issue, including the B one, um, and also the higher B uh, zero. And the good thing for our uh, sequence is that we are kind of addressing these kind of issue. Uh, so it's good for both three T and seven T. So we could take advantage of the you know SR gain um, there. Yeah. And um, I guess one more question that I'll post to, to both of you, it's just kind of a broad, um, broader issue of you know, acquiring data in, in individuals over the course of time. Do things like scanner upgrades or things to software changes, things like that, how, how much of a concern um, is that with regard to, to these studies? And um, yeah, how big of an effect do you think that would have on, on your data? Do you want to go first or? You mean the, you know, the scanner, um, you know, the version, um, you know, update the software based Right, right, software based sometimes change things in the sequences in the background, that's, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I think um, that software uh, update, it's a problem when we try to like make the acquisition. For, for me, like it's, uh, it's definitely, pro you know, a, one thing to consider when we make the, you know, acquisition available or the sequence available. Um, and uh, I think we're, um, you know, the the product sequence will change, and that's why, you know, it's a good thing that's, you know, right now it's having like, um, you know, the um, the open like source implementation of the sequence, uh, so that uh, it's less reliable on, you know, vendor uh, software update um, like POSIC, uh, how it can, you know. Uh, uh, open source and implementation of the sequence. Um, yeah, I guess uh, for for uh, for the acquisition part and that that is the one, one factor to consider and we're keep updating the software version when we try to release the sequence, but uh, taking advantage of the open platform would be uh, one way to address this issue. And for a data set, I think uh, it's, uh, I, I compared to the acquisition would be less of a problem. Uh, you know, compared to the uh, uh, trying to make the sequence available. Um, and also like, 
I think after software uh, update necessary quality control uh, would be uh, would also be very important uh, to make sure that the data and uh, um, acquisition is kind of you know the, the quality is controlled. That's all I know. So for, for us at Neuromod, obviously, um, software updates are a very big worry, particularly because uh, Siemens recently had one or was suggesting one for the 3P for the Prisma Fit. Uh, we actually delayed. We, we have enough sway at the Nijing Center. Um, uh, I, and I think the, the MRI physicist agreed. I think, uh, as you can imagine, Neuromod is a big user of, the, of 18 hours a week of the scanner. So we've actually delayed um, a recent software upgrade. And uh, we'll probably have to go through it at some point, but I you definitely have to do some quality control. <laughs> we are delaying as long as possible um, is where is our current status, I think, um, just because we're, yeah, at least until we hopefully finish yeah. the, the first round of Neuromod data acquisition, I guess, wherever that lands. But definitely, uh, if we had to do an upgrade, that would be very worrisome. But you know, we don't have a choice. This is part of sharing a scanner. Yeah. Right. Unless you're HTTP right. and you have your own scanner, then the rest of us have to share. <laughs> OK, uh, well, if there are uh, no further questions, uh, I'd like to thank all of you once again for joining us today. Um, there, one second, there's. There are a few questions in the Q&A, uh, but I don't see them in my I think uh, I see them chat. in the, they're under the, um, I think one of them is, do you, to me, I think I see is, do you check hearing before you okay. start an acquisition? Oh, you want to go this way, yeah. Yeah, the question is, um, did you use denoising at the beginning of the pre-processing and um, how does the unringing look like on such high spatial resolution data? Did you consider to look at the phase? Yeah, this is a question to, uh, directed to me, I guess. Yeah, uh, um, we did not use any denoising at the beginning of the, any pre-processing, um, I guess. Um, or we we also we 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 didn't do any on raining um, on the high spatial resolution data either, and um, I guess uh, we try to keep it as like more original as it is. Um, I think yeah we probably did some like after the uh, partial Fourier uh, reconstruction we um, I don't remember the. Yeah, we probably did some appetization uh, along the, you know, um, after the Fourier, uh, partial Fourier reconstruction to help with the, uh, help with the, you know, uh, that, but nothing uh, fancy. We, we didn't do any denoising or other uh, waning processes um, on that. And the data looks, uh, I think, if we look at the data, and I think the data look okay, and also, by taking advantage of the multi-session acquisition, the SNR also um, look good. And and but we we do welcome any um, for users to develop, you know, using our data set to you know test these kind of processing methods or uh, develop new processing or test the processing um, based on our data set. Um, I don't remember the last uh, question. Oh. Um, I don't know if I answer most of them. Um, can I look at the, uh, that's very, uh, could you, uh, the acquisition for each session taken at the same time of the day? I'm thinking of the result change along this. Yeah, we didn't, uh, for the night session, um, it's, you know, it's, we are, we, we were acquiring the, uh, subject at the roughly the same time at around like six o'clock and uh, you know at night uh, you know in the afternoon and so um, but I, I agree there is going to be some like physiological changes even um, uh, even when we acquire the data at the same time as during the day but there's still going to be physiological changes along you know uh, along the time because we're acquiring this next session across uh, one month. So there there might be some, you know, results or changes in the data. Um, yeah, to answer your question. 
Um, there's a question here for um, Julie as well. Um, do you check the hearing before each session um, acquisition? Um, and do you have any issue with the long hours of infrared light exposure with the um, eye tracking? So um, hearing, we actually did a, like a two year long study on, um, we actually, um, on the hearing of our participants, uh, obviously we didn't want to make our participants go deaf, but it was also really a unique opportunity to work with an audiologist here to look at the effects of scanning on hearing or ex extended amounts of scanning on hearing. And we did see some hearing changes, but that weren't related to the scanner that were likely related either to, um, for example, we had one participant that uh, during COVID had an 11 month break and then suddenly came back with a hearing deficit in one ear, just a, a reduction of their sensitivity to hearing. So some of those things happened that were just life related, uh, but lucky uh, it would seem like pretty reliable amongst all the subjects. We're not seeing any effective scanning. We tested the anatomical sequence. We tested test the functional sequences. We really, um, we looked at it pretty intensively to see. In terms of the eye tracking, no, there's only one subject for whom, um, uh, there's an issue they can still support the eye tracker but they have a sensitivity in their eye from a prior accident years and years ago so but definitely no issues with the infrared um the the infrared is like underneath we see it it's through the camera so you don't actually see it so it's um uh, sorry it's through the the mirror in the in the bore so uh it's an mrc camera so you don't actually really see it while you're in there so so far no but if you have any reasons you should be careful definitely uh, ping me uh me uh, through one of the channels. Uh, definitely don't want to damage anybody's eyeballs. Um, well, if there's no more questions, I think, um, again, thank you both for, for the talks and for the discussion. Um, and we can conclude this session. Just a final reminder to the audience that um, there are these sessions going um, every five hours or so. So please uh, keep an eye on the, uh, on the uh, schedule. And um, thanks.